Okay, good afternoon. So today we are going to continue with the nervous system and it is the second session on the brain and uh, at the end of the session we will have a brief idea about the cranial nerves. Some of these cranial nerves we will come back to them and study their peripheral and central connections, especially the ones that are related to vision, olfaction, the uh, auditory nerve and the vestibular nerve as well. So let me remind you of where we left last time. It was a section, a coronal section of the brain, like this one. And we mentioned that on, on the surface of the brain, on the surface of the cerebrum, there's the gray matter that forms the cerebral cortex. And uh, uh, this cortex has different functions. And the cortex is uh, described in different lobes of the brain. There are two hemispheres, and in between them, there is a, a longitudinal cerebral fissure. And one of the lobes here is the frontal or, or the parietal lobe. I would say that this is the parietal lobe. And the other one is the temporal lobe. And if we separate these lobes from each other on the lateral side, there is a horizontal sulcus. And uh, you can see the hidden parts of the brain of the cerebral cortex, which is called the insula, okay? Now, inside the gray matter, there is white matter. So all of this is white matter. And within the white matter, as you can see here, there are collections of gray matter, and these form the nuclei. And we call them the basal nuclei. Several times I mentioned the basal nuclei, and, and then I said we'll talk about them later on. So today we are going to talk about the basal nuclei. They are collections of gray matter. You know the gray matter is the nerve cell bodies. So they are collections of gray matter within the white matter of the cerebrum. And they are, uh, you can see them here in uh, this coronal section. One of them, one of these basal nuclei, looks like a lens. So it is called the lentiform nucleus. If we go into details of this lens, we will see that it, it is in two portions. The portion that is more medial, and that is probably clearer on, on your computer's uh, screen rather than this screen, and it is a little bit paler than the lateral portion. Okay, so the lateral portion is called the putamen, and the medial portion is called the globus pallidus. Pallidus means pale, from pallor. So it is the pale body. So there is the putamen and globus pallidus. Together, they form the lentiform nucleus. And if we go a little bit lateral here at this location, and again, I, I would say that it will be better seen on your computer. And here again, there is a very thin plate of gray matter just deep to the uh, uh, cortex of the insula. And this is called the claustrum. Okay. So now we have the lentiform nucleus, the claustrum. Lentiform nucleus consists of the putamen and the globus pallidus. And in addition to that, the basal ganglia. In the basal ganglia, we have another nucleus, which is called the caudate nucleus. So you can see part of the caudate nucleus in this section. This is the caudate nucleus. Why do we call it the caudate nucleus? Because it has a tail. So in three dimensions, that will be the caudate nucleus, the blue one here. That will be the caudate nucleus. It has a head, which is very prominent. That's the site of the asterisk. It has a head, and the head projects into the lateral ventricle of the brain. This is the region of the lateral ventricle of the brain. Again, I'm going to talk about the ventricular system. If you go back to the section, that is the lateral ventricle of the brain. It's a space inside the brain. And you can see the, how the caudate nucleus, or this part uh, of the caudate nucleus, is projecting into the lateral ventricle of the brain. And then, after the head, there is the body, and then the tail of the caudate nucleus. So it looks like comma shape, and because it has a tail, it is called the caudate nucleus. But you will not be able to see it as a caudate nucleus, or as a in three dimensions in one section. So in this section, it is the caudate nucleus, but you cannot see the entire extent uh, of the caudate nucleus, or why is it called the caudate nucleus? Again, the caudate nucleus, the lentiform nucleus, and the claustrum, uh, together, they constitute the basal nuclei. There is sometimes another term which is used here, 
for the combination of the lentiform nucleus and the caudate nucleus. Um, they call it the corpus striatum. So you might uh, uh, hear these terms uh, in neuroanatomy textbooks. That's what they mean. A, lentiform, um, a corpus striatum is a combination of the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus. The lentiform nucleus itself is formed of a putamen and a globus pallidus. If we add the claustrum here to all these structures, we will get the basal nuclei. So what is the function of the basal, base, uh, these basal nuclei? It's actually they regulate motor functions. We're going to um, discuss the functions again when we deal with the motor system, but they are mainly for motor functions. Some some of them, the functions of some of them are unknown, but mainly they regulate the motor function, initiation, termination of movement, sometimes repetitive movements like swinging of the arm during walking or running, control of the tone of the muscle. That's why when these nuclei are affected, then it results, for example, in, in tremors, okay, or abnormal movements or tremors. It doesn't result in paralysis. So these nuclei, they contribute to what we call, when we deal with the uh, motor system, what we call the extra pyramidal system. The pyramidal system, the fibers that pass through the pyramid of the medulla oblongata, these are the corticospinal fibers that are directly related to the, to the motor uh, function of muscle. If these fibers, if this pathway is affected, this results in paralysis. But around this pathway, an indirect pathway is present, which is called the extrapyramidal pathway, and it is partly governed or controlled by these basal nuclei. Remember that these basal nuclei were mentioned last time when we dealt with the uh, substantia nigra, and we said that the, the cells of the substantia nigra they end, they send their axons to the basal nuclei. And when the substantia nigra is destroyed, this will result in Parkinson's disease, okay? So because impulses from substantia nigra uh, will be deficient uh, um, um, in the region of the basal nuclei. Um, if you have attended the Body World's uh, exhibition last year here in Halifax, you would have noticed that in the last section, the um, Gunther von Hagens, whose silhouette uh, figure is shown here, he has Parkinson's disease now. And um, he showed his picture, that is the silhouette of his profile, superimposed on a skull x-ray, or a, sorry, a skull, yes, a lateral skull x-ray, and showing uh, here, as you can see, that there are electrodes implanted into his brain. And there are always electrical impulses through these electrodes. Actually, these electrical impulses are connected to the basal ganglia, to his basal ganglia, in order trying to compensate for the loss of impulses coming from, from the substantia nigra. Okay? So uh, these basal nuclei are involved in coordination of the skeletal muscle activity, control of repetitive movements, tone of the muscle, and that's why, again, I repeat, when they are destroyed, they don't result in paralysis, but they result in abnormal movements or they result in tremors and changes in the tone of the muscle. So far about the basal nuclei. Now, the second topic of today, which was also mentioned, probably touched last time, was the limbic system. And this limbic system is a collection of nuclei, cortical areas, white matter in the brain. Together, they constitute the limbic system. Uh, limbus means like a, a rim. So it is like a rim around uh, around the brain, something like that. That's why it's called the limbic system. And um, as I said, it includes cortical areas, subcortical areas, white matter, and uh, nuclei uh, as well. The main functions, there are many functions attributed to this system. One of them is, the, is that it's the emotional brain, plays part in emotions, including like pleasure, pain, anger, 
affection. There is one of the nuclei here, which is called the, am the amygdaloid nucleus. I'm not sure if you have heard of it before. If you have any psychology course, maybe they, they mentioned it. The, it's mainly involved in affection, this amygdaloid nucleus. And uh, the other part is that some of the other areas are related to olfaction. Remember I mentioned that olfaction is the only type of sensation that does not relate to the thalamus. Uh, all other types of sensation, they have to relate in the thalamus. The thalamus is the hub of all sensations except olfaction. So olfaction goes directly to the cortical areas in the limbic system and limbic system is related to olfaction. And the other function is that it is related to memory, especially this part of the limbic system, this part which is called the hippocampus. Okay, probably it's a difficult name, but you need to memorize it. The hippocampus, it is the part that is part of the limbic system that is related to memory. And it has something which is probably unusual about the nervous uh, system. It has a small area. You don't need to memorize the name of the area. It's called the dentate lobe. It's, it's here, a small area. And this area, unusually, the cells of this area, although they are neurons, but they can undergo mitosis. Remember we said that the nervous tissue does not multiply, but it is only, this is one exception here, is that these, these are neurons, they are not neuroglia. Neuroglia, they can undergo mitosis. That's no, no, uh, not a big deal. But here these are neurons and they can undergo mitosis. And as I said, that the uh, hippocampus is mainly concerned with memory. Then we have the cerebellum. Remember we started Last lecture, first slide, was parts of the central nervous system. We said it is the cerebrum, diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. And we studied the cerebrum, diencephalon, and brainstem, or part of the cerebrum, not all of it. But today, we're going to talk a little bit about the cerebellum. The cerebellum, as the name indicates, it's the small brain, cerebellum. So it is the small brain. It is located here below the occipital lobe, let's say, of the cerebral hemisphere, and there is a deep fissure separating it, a transverse fissure separating it from the cerebrum, and as you can see that it is located behind the brainstem. And we mentioned that previously last time, that it is connected to the, each part of the brainstem with a pair of peduncles, small feet, cerebellar peduncles. So, so we have the superior cerebellar peduncle connecting it with the midbrain, middle cerebellar peduncle connecting it with the pons, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle connecting it with the medulla oblongata. Also, you will notice that it has like a highly folded cortex, again, to increase the surface area of the cortex. So the gray matter is located outside, as you can see here in this uh, diagram. The gray matter is outside, and it looks like uh, a tree. The, the white matter inside it looks like the branching of a tree. And this is a mid-sagittal section, and that's why this pattern of white matter distribution in, in a section of the cerebellum, they call it the arbor viti, means arbor means tree, arbor and VT means life, so the tree of life. Because it looks like tree, they use this term arbor VT to describe the distribution of the white matter inside the cerebellum. And here we don't use the term gyrus. In the brain, remember, in the cerebrum, we use the term gyrus and sulcus. Here we use the terms folia and sulci. So we have a lot of folia and sulci as well as some deep, deep grooves, which are called fissures, and they divide the cerebellum into lobes. I'm not going to talk about the lobes of the cerebellum, but as you can see that there is an anterior lobe here, a posterior lobe there, and again, you will find that there are two hemispheres, two cerebellar hemispheres, and the middle portion of the cerebellum here, this one, is called the vermis. Vermis means worm because it looks like a worm. You can see this, these are the eyes. So it looks like a worm. So that's why they call it the vermis. It's the middle part of the cerebellum. 
between the two cerebellar hemispheres. So we have folia and sulci instead of gyri and sulci. But we still have fissures, we still have hemispheres. And the cerebellar peduncles. Some, the inferior cerebellar peduncles that connect the medulla to the pons, they carry information from the rest of the body from proprioceptors. Remember I mentioned that there, is, there are proprioceptors in muscles, in tendons, in ligaments. There are proprio, in joint capsules, there are proprioceptors. They sense the position and the location in the space. Some of these proprioceptor information or proprioceptive information, they, are, they reach our conscious level. Like I know now about my position in space, position of my muscles. But even though there are some other proprioceptors that send unconscious proprioception to the cerebellum so that the cerebellum can control the tone of muscles together with the extra pyramidal system. So there is conscious proprioception and there is unconscious proprioception the cerebrum is involved with the conscious proprioception recognition of the position in the space and this takes place in the in the parietal lobe of the cerebral hemisphere so these information regarding proprioception regarding vestibular information when i when i say vestibular you will recognize or notice later on that this means related to balance because it starts this i'm referring to a vestibular system okay uh, which is located in the in the inner ear and uh, so vestibular information information related to balance are also received in the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle the middle cerebellar peduncle which connects the cerebellum to the pons Remember last time I mentioned something about multiple nuclei in the pons called pontine nuclei, and they receive fibers from the cortex, and then they send these fibers, they relay in these pontine nuclei, and then they send fibers to the cerebellum. This is another part of the extrapyramidal pathway. The superior cerebellar peduncle mainly contains fibers arising from the cerebellum and they are connected to the thalamus, to other parts of the, to the, to the brain stem, to other parts of the body, okay? But it is mainly the superior cerebellar peduncle, it is mainly efferents from the, uh, um, uh, carries motor impulses from the cerebellum, the output of the cerebellum, to the midbrain and the thalamus. What is the function of the cerebellum? So now we know. Probably we can guess some of the functions of the cerebellum. So based on these sensory data related to balance, related to proprioception, therefore it can coordinate complex movements like riding a bike, playing a piano. So it's a coordination of complex movements. And if this is lost there, therefore, and, and regulation of posture and balance. So if this is lost, these are examples of what happens if the patient has a cerebellar dysfunction. There will be incoordination of muscular activity. Uh, this is called ataxia. Well, you can watch the video here. It's less than one minute video. And we'll show you this patient who has a cerebellar problem. And you will find that she can barely uh, follow a, uh, and touch a pen. That is, the examiner is t asking her to touch the tip of her finger and then touch the, touch the pen. And so she is aiming and then she can touch the pen tip of her finger, but it will be difficult for her to go directly and touch the pen. It might be easy for you to do that now, but for her, it will be like that. Okay, so there is loss of incoordination. There is incoordination, loss of coordination. And this is called ataxia. Proprioception, proprioceptive impulses are not good, are, not, are damaged, not received well. So this results in tremor and hypotonia. And of course, equilibrium information are also not perceived well, and this will result in vertigo. These are the main signs and symptoms of a cerebellar a dysfunction, and I'm mentioning them to you in order to understand the functions of the cerebellum. So this, this is the function of the cerebellum, this is what happens if the cerebellum or its connections are damaged. Again, the long-awaited topic, 
cerebrospinal fluids. This is um, a fluid that is produced by ependymal cells in the ventricular system, about 150 ml of fluid. It's a clear, colorless, contains uh, glucose, proteins, and ions. And it is mainly, it is located in the subarachnoid space. You remember the three uh, layers of uh, meninges, the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. So it is located in between the arachnoid and the pia in the subarachnoid space. And it is located in the ventricular system of the brain. You can see it here. This is the ventricular system of the brain. Embryologically speaking, the, the brain develops from a tube. So there is a tube to start with. And this tube has a cavity. It's called the neural tube. And then this tube will enlarge. And so if we, if we are looking at the tube now from the lateral side, let's say, it will, it will get um, um, folded like this. And then it will get enlarged. And so that's how the nervous system develops. Starts as a tube folded and then enlarged what remains of the tube is the ventricular system and the central canal of the spinal cord okay so it was it was, there was a cavity from the beginning what is the function it's mechanical protection because it was mentioned when we dealt with the protection of the brain protection of the spinal cord and we can add to that is the buoyancy effect. Probably I mentioned that to you or to the other group last time, that if you take the, the brain outside the cranial cavity, you put it on the table, the brain will become a little bit flattened because it's like jelly-like and it can only maintain its shape because it is floating in water. And also it acts like a cushion for any hit on the, on the skull. So it softens the impact with the bony walls. Um, then it's a chemical protection, um, optimal ionic concentration. We will see that in a moment that there is a barrier. We call it a blood cerebrospinal fluid uh, barrier. So not, not everything in the blood will be transmitted into the cerebrospinal fluid. There is some sort of selection here. So it acts as a chemical protection. And we mentioned previously uh, in the first lecture that this nervous system is so delicate that it requires a very controlled extracellular environment. And then uh, this fluid is circulating. It is not stagnant. Uh, we will see that it circulates like 20 milliliters every hour is circulating. So the entire fluid, if the fluid is 150 ml, let's say, or 80 to 150, like within seven hours, it's going to be replaced totally. So it is it is replacing itself, let's say, three times a day. So it is circulating. So the nutrients and waste products will circulate and go back to the, that are produced in the central nervous system, they will go back to the blood. Because the CSF is produced by the blood and returns back to the blood. And this is what forms the CSF circulation. This is, a, you can see here that this is a capillary and we will uh, study the, histology of capillaries later on, but you can see that the capillary is uh, very simple. It is lined by simple squamous epithelium, which is called endothelium. And then these are the ependymal cells. So on one side is the endothelial cell of the capillary. On the other side are the ependymal cells, the cells that have cilia and microvilli here. And these are the neuroglial cells that produce the cerebrospinal fluid. These cells are connected with each other. If you look at it here, they are connected with each other by tight junctions. And it is these tight junctions that will constitute what we call the blood CSF barrier. So not everything that is present in the blood can pass to the CSF. Uh, sometimes it, is, it acts like a protection against harmful substances like toxins or something like that. The barrier is formed mainly by the tight junctions between the ependymal cells. And it is the ependymal cells that are going to secrete the CSF. It doesn't allow anything that passes in between them to go into the cavities of the brain. And you can see it here. You can see this is a horizontal section of the brain. And these are the two lateral ventricles. Each one of them is a ventricle two lateral ventricles constituting part of the 
ventricular system of the brain. This is the entire ventricular system of the brain. Looks like if you look at this picture here, look, concentrate on the blue structures. It looks like a ram's head. It's like this one. So we have two lateral ventricles. Each one of them is in a cerebral hemisphere. And this is if we look at it from the front. If we look at it from the side, you can see that each lateral ventricle looks like the letter C, probably. And it is here where the caudate nucleus is located. I'm just drawing it now, superimposing it. So that's the head of the caudate nucleus, and that's the body and the tail of the caudate nucleus. And you can see that, again, it has lateral ventricle. It looks like a letter C with some horns. So it has an anterior horn, a posterior horn, and an inferior horn. And the third ventricle, of course, we don't have second ventricle. We have two lateral ventricles. So it's up to you which one you'd, you would like to, to call number one. But they don't call them one and two. But it's obvious that we have two lateral ventricles. So the next one is the third ventricle. Okay, they are almost the same. So that's the lateral ventricle. It's in the midline. And in three dimensions, it is, here is the di uh, diencephalon, the thalamus, and that is the other thalamus. So it is a very, it's like a slit-like space, very narrow space. If you, if you have two eggs, two boiled eggs, you bring them together, put a narrow space in between them, probably a, a very a thick paper in between them, that will be the site of the third ventricle. And it is connected to the lateral ventricles by a narrow foramen, a small narrow foramen. Obviously, it's called the interventricular foramen. And then from the third ventricle, we have this duct of water, the aqueduct, that passes through the midbrain, and then it enlarges to become the fourth ventricle. So the ventricular system, all of it is connected, and it is inside the ventricular system. If you look at this animation here, you can follow the, the direction of flow of the fluid. It is produced in the lateral ventricle, added to it in the third, and then this is the aqueduct for the ventricle. Uh, each part of the ventricular system will add some fluid to it from a plexus of capillaries, which is called the choroid plexus. Look at the ventricle here. Can you see here that this is now, it is enlarged. And you can see that there is this choroid plexus. Look at the tip of the pointer now. Okay. So this is the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle. That's how it looks. Tuft of capillaries like this one, uh, covered by ependymal cells. And this is where CSF is produced. We have a choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle. We have another choroid plexus in the third and another one in the fourth. And that's all. We don't have other choroid plexuses. And not, not the entire part of the ventricle. It is only in a certain region of the ventricle that we have the choroid plexus that produces the CSF. Now, the CSF is produced. So what's going to happen to it? It is produced, it takes this circulation, goes from the lateral to the third, from the third through the aqueduct to the fourth. Some of it might, might trickle to the central canal of the spinal cord, some of it, but we need it to be drained to the blood, to the venous side of the blood, because it arises from the arterial side, it should be drained to the venous side. And here we have the venous sinuses, which are present in between the two layers of dura mater of the cerebrum. Last time I mentioned that the dura mater in the cerebrum, unlike that of the spinal cord, has two layers. And these two layers, they might separate from each other and they form venous sinuses like this one. So you can see here in this coronal section, the red structure is the pyre and this um, blue, let's say, uh, structure is the arachnoid. And we have projections of arachnoid, like villi, finger-like processes, okay, um, of arachnoid mater that project into the ventricular system. These are called the arachnoid villi. 
because they are processes of the arachnoid mater that project into the venous system. We call them arachnoid villi. Some of them, they collect together and they form large granulations so you can see them by your naked eye in, in, during dissection. But there are many of them that cannot be seen. So by this way, the CSF will pass from the subarachnoid space to the venous system. Now the question is, how does the CSF reaches the subarachnoid space? I was just talking here. I ended my story at this location. I said, from lateral ventricle, interventricular foramen, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle. And then I suddenly I went and said that it goes to the subarachnoid space. How does it go to the subarachnoid space? From inside the brain to the subarachnoid space. So there are, in fact, there are openings, small, tiny openings. One of them is located in the midline at this location. Two of them are located on the lateral side. Now, these openings, they have names. I'm not going to, sh to um, uh, ask you to memorize these names, but uh, these are three openings, one in the middle, two on the lateral side. They connect the ventricular system with the subarachnoid space. That's how the continuity takes place between the um, ventricular system and the subarachnoid space. You can see this is a summary of the CSF circulation from lateral ventricle to the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. And then you can see here through the lateral and median apertures. And then they go to the subarachnoid space, then the arachnoid villi, which project into the venous blood. That's how the CSF is circulated. If there is a problem here, there is an obstruction in this system, then CSF will not be drained. It will only collect inside the brain, and this results in a condition which usually it is congenital. We call it hydrocephalus, a lot of water inside the brain. In the Middle Ages, they used to treat that by making an incision here in the soft area. Remember the the, uh, the anterior fontanelle, and the water gushes out like a fountain. That's why they called it fontanelle. Probably I mentioned that earlier. This is to show you the blood supply of the brain. We are going to come back to the blood supply of the brain when we study the cardiovascular system, but just to let you know that there are two systems supplying the blood to the brain. The brain requires a lot of blood supply. It needs a lot of oxygen, consumes like 20% of the oxygen of the body. So there is one system called through the internal carotid artery, and the other system is the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery, as you can see, the arteries, they pass into the skull uh, through the foramen magnum. This is another structure that passes through foramen magnum. And the internal carotid artery passes into the skull through the carotid canal, and inside the skull, they anastomose with each other into, uh, they form a circle. We call it the arterial circle of Willis. So anastomosis, when two vessels, they come and face each other mouth to mouth, stoma, anastomosis, and this will provide an alternative circulation. If one of them is narrow, then the other one might compensate. So this, these anastomoses are important, but the problem here, as you can see here in this section of the brain, coronal section, that the branches that go inside the brain, they are usually, they are end arteries. They, um, they do not anastomose. So if they are blocked, there, there's a clot, there's narrowing, there's bleeding here, this will result in what we call a, a cerebrovascular accident, CVA, okay? It can be, as you can see here, it might be a, a narrowing, it might be a thrombus, a clot, blood clot coming from somewhere else and blocking them, or it might be a bleeding. This is to show you the blood-brain barrier. Actually, we mentioned about the blood-brain barrier before. It is the barrier between the capillaries of the blood. You can see the capillary here is lined by endothelial cells, and these endothelial cells, they have tight junctions in between them. This is the essence of the blood-brain barrier. This is the main structure that forms the blood-brain barrier, the tight junctions between the endothelial capillaries. What helps in this blood-brain barrier are these food processes of the astrocytes. 
Remember the astrocytes, the star-shaped neuroglial cells that contribute to the formation of the blood-brain barrier. And the other contributor to the blood-brain barrier is the basement membrane. I remember when we dealt with the uh, epithelial tissue, we said that the epithelial tissue sits on our, or stands on a basement membrane. So that is the basement membrane, partly produced by the connective tissue, partly produced by the epithelium. It is the basement membrane. The type of the basement membrane here, we, we call it continuous basement membrane. Because in some other capillaries, as we will study that later on, the basement membrane has openings that has defects in it. So it's called fenestrated. Fenestra means window, like fenêtre in French. So this one is non-fenestrated. It is continuous. That's why it also contributes to the formation of the blood-brain barrier. The cranial nerves, as the name indicates, they are connected to the brain and they arise from the cranium. So that's why they are called cranial nerve, as opposed to spinal nerves. And we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, 12 pairs of cranial nerves. We can either use numbers, and in this case, we have to use the Roman numerals. So we refer to them as CN, for example, VI, which means the sixth cranial nerve. Or we can name them, like the sixth cranial nerve is called the abducent nerve. So the first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve. And again, we are going to study it in much detail later on. And then the second one is the optic nerve. And this is responsible for the vision. As we will see that it is responsible for vision and it relays in the thalamus. And then the fibers will terminate in which part of the cerebral cortex. the occipital lobe, because it contains the visual area. And then we have number three, which is called oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerve, three, four, and six. These three cranial nerves are involved in the nerve supply, motor nerve supply, of the muscles that move the eyeball. They are so delicate muscles and the movements of the eyeball are very important for our binocular vision. Otherwise, if one of these muscles is paralyzed or is not working well, then do we have blindness in that case, or what do we have? Okay, so we don't have blindness because blindness is our optic nerve, but we have what we call diplopia, double vision. They move the eyeball. They are called extraocular muscles. And then we have the trigeminal nerve. This nerve is mainly, it is sensory, and it's, it's the fifth cranial nerve, CNV, and it has, it's trigeminal because it has three large branches. So we call them divisions. So three divisions of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. In many of the dental procedures, they will anesthetize the maxillary or the mandibular uh, branches of the maxillary or the mandibular divisions of the trigeminal nerve. And is also, it's also motor, it's, it's sensory for the face and also motor to the muscles of mastication, the muscles that move the mandible, like the masseter and temporalis muscle. Remember these muscles, we mentioned their name, we talked about them when we dealt with the muscular system, muscles of mastication. And then we have the, seventh cranial nerve, where's the six? The abducens, okay, extraocular muscle. And then the seventh cranial nerve is the, called the facial nerve, and it supplies the muscles of facial expression, the other group of muscles in the face that move our skin of the face and produce facial expression. That was mentioned earlier, but to add to, to this now is that this is not the only thing that is produced by the facial nerve, but also facial nerve carries some parasympathetic motor fibers that supply the um, salivary glands, the lacrimal gland, and also has sensory components. It carries sensations of taste from the tongue as well. We will talk about this when we deal with the taste sensation. And then I'm jumping, uh, leaving the uh, seventh cranial nerve 
Eighth is called the vestibular cochlea. We are going to study that later on. Ninth is the glossopharyngeal. Ten is the vagus. Eleven is accessory. And the twelve is the hypoglossal. As the name indicates, glossal means tongue, but it is not involved in the sensation from the tongue, taste or other sensations. It moves the muscles of the tongue. The hypoglossal nerve, the 12th cranial nerve, you can see CMXII is the 12th cranial nerve. It moves the muscles of the tongue. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a happy Thanksgiving day.